Okay, we are live. Sergeant, will you please begin your recording? Computer recording started. Thank you. Sergeant Martinez, will you begin with your opening statement, sir? Thank you, sir. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your video. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at the following address, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that address is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Diana Ayala, and I am the chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I would like to welcome you to our remote hearing. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that we have been joined by council members Kalos, Chen, Ku, Yeager, Brennan, Menchaca, and Rosenthal. Today, we will be hearing testimony on two bills. The first is intro 2130 from council member Rosenthal in relation to providing notice regarding student loan forgiveness programs to certain employees and applicants for employment. Student loan debt in this country is out of control. Earlier this year, it totaled over 1.7 trillion, and it is the second highest type of consumer debt after housing. Student debt has continued to increase annually, even after the president put loan repayments on hold due to COVID-19. In New York City, student debt also does not affect all graduates equally. Joint research from the Department of Consumer and Worker Protections and the Federal Reserve of New York found that borrowers, borrowers in low-income neighborhoods experience the highest loan distress. According to their report, borrowers in my borough, the Bronx, and also in Brooklyn experience the highest rates of loan defaults. Some student loan borrowers will pursue loan forgiveness programs to offset their huge financial burden, but these programs can be complicated. For example, data has shown that for the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, where federal student loans can be forgiven after 120 payments, which is usually around 10 years of public service, 98% of applicants had their forgiveness applicants applications denied. Intro 2130 would help alleviate some of this confusion by requiring DCWP's Office of Labor Policy and Standards to develop a notice of employees and job applicants regarding the availability of federal and state student loan forgiveness programs. This notice would then be required to be provided to job applicants, whether they are applying for a job with a city agency or with a private sector employee. The second bill we will be hearing uh, is on feedback, on feedback on is intro 2410 from council member Brooks Powers on behalf of the mayor in relation to agency actions in case of breach of security. As more work and activities shift online, data breaches are becoming more common. As we know, the city's law department was hacked earlier this year. Aside from the trove of confidential information that was exposed, it also meant that the agency network was taken offline, creating delays in cases even a month later. In 2019, the state enacted laws to help uh, protect against data breaches. Known as the SHIELD Act, it requires the city adopt a data breach notification policy or local law that is consistent with the state law. Intro 2410 updates current city law and would require a city agency that has suffered a breach of security involving private information to private, um, promptly disclose that, that fact to the city chief uh, privacy officer, the Office of Cyber Command and the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications. This bill also expands the understanding of breaches for example, obligations would be required to, uh, in situations when it is reasonably believed uh, to have been accessed, disclosed, or used, not simply acquired by an unauthorized person. The bill would also require the Office of Cyber Command in consultation with the Chief uh, Privacy Officer and the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications to create protocols for agency coordination and record keeping for any breach of security. The committee looks forward to hearing from the administration on these bills and we thank them for their attendance today. Before they begin though, I would like to offer the bill sponsors a moment to make a statement. Council member Rosenthal.
Could someone please unmute Councilmember yeah. Rosenthal? Just done. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning. I'm Councilmember Helen Rosenthal. My pronouns are she and her. I want to start by thanking Chair Ayala for holding this hearing and including my legislation. A few years ago, a staff member in my office who owed over $40,000 in student loans figured out that she was qualified for public service loan forgiveness, but had never been made aware of this fact. This staffer worked in government for some time before she began the application process to enter the federal uh, loan forgiveness program. Introduction 2130 is a simple bill that will ensure all city employees are automatically informed if they're eligible for public service loan forgiveness under either a federal or state program. The timing of this bill is critical. To date, successful, successfully obtaining public service loan forgiveness has not been an entirely straightforward process and the opportunity to obtain forgiveness has not been widely publicized. The Biden administration plans to make the federal public service loan forgiveness program more accessible. So a much larger number of public sector workers can apply, can apply and qualify for debt relief. The plan changes could assist roughly 550,000 borrowers. We all know student loan debt is essentially crushing millions of Americans. The debt that so many Americans, New Yorkers included, are carrying prohibits them from building long-term careers in public service because their salaries simply cannot sustain the loan payments. We need our best and brightest working in the service of our city in order to recruit and keep them, ensuring that they are aware of what they already are eligible for is the least that we can do. This is a simple step forward to close an information gap. Nonetheless, ensuring that every city employee knows that they may be able to eventually cancel their student debt will encourage more of them to pursue this option. And I wanna be clear that I support the growing movement across our country to cancel a large portion of student loan debt entirely. I'm optimistic that agency leadership will be supportive of this common sense legislation to help city workers remain in public service and have a brighter financial future. And I look forward to the testimony. I do just wanna thank Jackie Bazoulas for drafting this bill. And I'd also like to thank my chief of staff, Cindy Cardinal, my legislative director, Madhuri Shukla, and my communications director, Sarah Crean, as well as the committee staff for their work in preparing for this hearing. Thank you again, Chair Ayala. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. Uh, I will now turn it over to the moder I will moderator, uh, Committee Council Stephanie Jones to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair Ayala. Good morning, everybody. I'm Stephanie Jones, counsel to the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing, and I will be moderating this hearing today. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelist will be. At this hearing, we will first be inviting testimony from the New York City Cyber Command, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. For all panelists when called to testify, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any. We will now call representatives of the administration to testify. We will be hearing testimony from Colin Ahern, Deputy Chief Information Security Officer of the New York City Cyber Command. We will also be joined for questions by Stephen Etanani, Executive Director of External Affairs at the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, and Rebecca Blatt, Senior Counsel at the Mayor's Office for Information Privacy. At this time, I will administer the affirmation to administration panelists. 
Administration panelists, please raise your right hands and I will call on each of you individually to respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Deputy Chief Ahern. I do. Thank you. Executive Director Atanani. I do. And Ms. Blatt. Yes, I do. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite Deputy Chief Ahern to present his testimony. Good morning, Chair Ayala and members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. My name is Colin Ahern and I am Deputy Chief Information Security Officer for the City of New York and I oversee Security Sciences at New York City Cyber Command. I am joined today, as noted by Rebecca Blatt, Senior Counsel for Legislative Affairs and Special Projects at the Mayor's Office of Information Privacy and Stephen Antonani, Director of External Affairs for the Department of Consumer and Workforce Protection. I am pleased to be here today to testify in support of Introduction 2410 legislation that will modernize the city's data breach notification law. In 2004, this city council was gravely concerned about the rise of identity theft, a relatively new criminal offense affecting New York City residents in higher number than almost anywhere else in the United States. In response to this crisis, this council passed local laws 45 and 46 of 2005, requiring prompt notification from city agencies and then Department of Consumer Affairs licensed businesses to individuals following security breaches involving their personal identifying information. Through local laws 45 and 46, the council sought to inform would-be victims that their security and their sensitive personal information had been violated, finding it to be one of the most effective ways to curtail identity thieves. Those laws are the foundation of the city's current data breach notification law. While protection against identity theft is still an important issue, technology, global connectivity through the internet of things, and attendant cybersecurity risks have all evolved beyond what might have been foreseeable or conceivable to the council and the stakeholders testifying before it in 2004 and 2005. Today, adversaries, which include a diverse set of actors such as nation states, advanced persistent threats, espionage actors, malicious groups and individuals are increasingly turning to cyber strategies to advance their desired outcomes, the pursuit of which is causing increased data theft and manipulation disruption to critical services, and untold societal and economic costs, often to our most vulnerable populations. The Council's passage of legislation establishing New York City Cyber Command and the Chief Privacy Officer in the City's Charter reflect its ongoing commitment to advancing the City's information security and privacy protection missions in the face of modern threats. Introduction 2410 builds on this legislative foundation to make our local data breach notification law more protective and to ensure there is a roadmap enabling Cyber Command, the Chief Privacy Officer, the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, and partner agencies to continue our zealous collaborative efforts to protect from and respond to data security incidents and breaches together for years to come. Also being heard today, 2130 would require the Department of Citywide Administrative Services to prepare a written notice for city employees and job applicants regarding the availability of federal and state student loan forgiveness programs. The Department of Consumer and Workforce Protection would also be required to make the notice available to employers in New York City to provide to employees and job applicants. The administration supports the intent of the legislation and my colleagues from DCWP can speak to this legislation. Thank you again, Chair Ayala and the members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing for the opportunity to speak today. We look forward to working with council on the, on the legislation being heard and welcome any questions. Thank you. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Ayala. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you. Chair Ayala, you may begin your questions. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for your testimony today. Um, so the current law requires a city agency that has suffered a security breach involving, uh, involving personal identification information to immediately disclose that fact to the police department. This bill instead requires this, uh, the disclosure to the city's chief privacy officer, the Office of Cyber Command, and do it. Why did you make this change and what impact will it have uh, to exclude the NYPD entirely? Chair Ayala, thank you for your question. Not all data security incidents contemplated under this law are breaches, and not all breaches are violations requiring notification to the police department. 
Cyber Command and the Chief Privacy Officer already have written processes in place to assess incidents and determine when to notify the NYPD. When we draft our protocols in collaboration with multiple stakeholders, including the Chief Privacy Officer, do it, the Law Department, and NYPD, we will ensure that notification requirements and procedures are clearly articulated, and we're happy to keep you and your committee updated on this process. Um, I, I just want to add that we've been joined by Council Member Brooks Powers. I'm not sure if she has any questions. Oh, can somebody unmute uh, Council Member Powers, please? Thank you so much, Chair, um, and good morning, everyone. Um, I appreciate being invited to this morning's Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing hearing. Thank you so much, Chair Ayala and the committee staff and members for organizing this hearing. I wanted to briefly speak in support of my bill, Intro 2410, which requires that the city's agencies and private businesses are required to promptly inform people that their information is at risk in the event of a data breach. New Yorkers deserve to know that their personal and private information is being kept safe. And this bill is an important step in protecting the privacy and security of our constituents' sensitive information. Um, I look forward to hearing the committee's thoughts on this bill. Um, but in light of some of the data breaches that have been experienced even over the course of the year, we want um, New Yorkers to know that we are taking matters such as this seriously and that we are working very hard to protect their, their personal information. So thank you so much once again for the opportunity to speak on this bill. Thank you, council member. Um, did you have any follow-up questions for um, Mr. Ahern? At this time, um, I do not, um, but I ask that I can reserve the, the right to come back and ask a question. Absolutely. Um, so I, I guess my follow-up question is, in your opinion, does the state go far enough uh, is there wiggle room to go beyond uh, state law? Thank you, Council Member, for your question. I think as data security breaches and incidents become more frequent, it's important not only to notify individuals who've been impacted, but to ensure that city agencies continue to learn and respond quickly. This introduction makes important amendments to our local law codifies protections in the close collaboration between several offices that are presenting here today. Um, I think it's important that we together remain flexible and continue our close collaborative efforts to ensure that both the laws reflect the landscape of the city's technology environment and the threats that it faces, including those to our most vulnerable residents. And additionally, that the procedures that will be drafted as a result of this legislation are in keeping with New Yorkers' expectations about this issue. Um, I'm sorry if I missed this, but can you explain what, what the agency uh, changes would, would be um, in implementing this bill? I think it's important to note that the procedures that the administrative uh, the administration has outlined, including those with the formation of Cyber Command and the Chief Privacy Officer, are largely in compliance with this introduction. This reflects our existing protocols for handling incidents of, of this manner. Uh, the administration has taken this issue very seriously, as has the council for many years. Um, and in the future, uh, as we draft these procedures, we can further clarify uh, the mechanisms by which multiple stakeholders will be engaged as noted. Uh, but again, to reinforce, uh, our current procedures are largely in keeping with the intent and, of this introduction. Absolutely. Um, all right, I, I don't have any further questions. Um, do any of the council members uh, have questions? Oh. Here I see council member Rosenthal has questions probably about her bills, her bill. Thank you so much. Um, I guess, is there someone from uh, the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection here? Yes, council member, I'm here. Oh, hey, hey uh, nice to see you. Thanks for coming by. You didn't submit any testimony or um, did I miss something? Uh, we don't have testimony on this. I'm happy to obviously engage with you uh, for Q&A. Um, 
uh, my colleague Colin did did speak about the administration's support for your legislation. Um, I do want to just note, though, like right at the top, your remarks about your staffer um, and um, her experience with the public student loan forgiveness program was particularly poignant, I think, and emblematic of countless folks, public servants, those in the nonprofit sector that are eligible for this program. But for a variety of reasons, including a lack of outreach from the United States Department of Education and various administrations, and an onerous set of requirements have not been able to engage in this program in a thoughtful way and how it was actually created. So I wanna thank you for your bill. Um, we're excited to um, continue this work. Um, and in a lot of ways we have been promoting and, and uh, su supporting where we can the public student loan forgiveness program. And I think this bill represents another great step in that direction. If, if I recall correctly, you have a pamphlet, right? That would tell me what the agency does now. Yeah, absolutely. So um, just to zoom out just very briefly, um, this student loan debt, as you know, and as the chair mentioned, is a national crisis in this country. Um, we estimate that at least a million residents of the city um, have student loan debt. And for that reason, our then commissioner, Lorelei Salas, made it a strategic priority for this agency, given our work and housing the Office of Financial Empowerment, to really tackle this issue head on. Because of that work um, and kind of an outcome of a public hearing that the commissioner held back in 2018, we developed a series of uh, pieces of collateral um, that's on our landing page right now. It's nyc.gov backslash student loans. Um, on that landing page, you'll see tips for really um, kind of every step of the process that, for example, um, a high school student in, uh, in New York City and their parents may, may need when they're, when they're uh, engaging with student loan debt. The first are tips, um, literally, it's called tips before enrolling in school. So right there that you have a primer. Um, a lot of the information in that tip booklet um, kind of sets the stage of what you can expect. Um, it's a daunting process. Obviously, uh, a lot of us here have been through that, uh, meeting with college counselors, guidance counselors, um, grasping with student loan debt, um, financial assistance, scholarships, grants, really discerning the differences between those, those different, uh, what are really financial products at the end of the day. Um, so there's that tip sheet. There's also a tip sheet um, for before you take out a loan. What can you expect when you take out a loan? Um, is interest going to accrue immediately once you take out that loan? Um, is it subsidized, unsubsidized, things like that? Um, there are also tips for what you should be doing once you have a loan. Um, particularly once you have a loan, um, is where we, we really um, highlight forgiveness programs like the Public Student Loan Forgiveness Program. Um, in that tip sheet, we talk about what jobs qualify for Public Student Loan Forgiveness, how you can enroll, and things of that nature. And I think a lot of that work will be um, part of a notice that will come out of your bill, council member. Um, so that we can work with our partners and, and DCAS to disseminate that to city employees and to make sure that, uh, you know, ideally all New Yorkers that are qualified can do that work. Um, I will say this, though. Um, just last month, our Office of Financial Empowerment and our commissioner, Peter Hatch, submitted comments to the United States Department of Education asking them to make real reforms to the public student loan forgiveness program. At the end of the day, this is a federal program. We can change things on our own here as a city agency. We can certainly amplify outreach as you're a contemplating council member. But at the end of the day, that program needs real reforms. We think it's onerous uh, to sign up 
as you mentioned, there's a, there is inherently a lack of outreach and advertisement for that program, which I'm sure contributed to your staff member, for example, not really identifying and understanding that she may have qualified or does qualify for it. Um, so we have a couple of ideas and we're encouraged that, that the Biden administration is going to take us up on them. Um, that may include things like having the IRS auto enroll folks. Um, they have all the information. They have our, 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 uh, a sense of our income. They know what jobs we have. Um, so why can't the IRS, you know, take on that, um, responsibility of sorts and have a, um, you know, have the burden be on them as opposed to on each individual, um, to make a determination. Um, of course we have, we're asking them to do more outreach to help supplement what I hope will be, um, our continued work on this, certainly with, with uh, hopefully your bill's prompt passage. And we also think, for example, that there should be increased eligibility for this program. We know that there are so many part-time workers that are um, city employees, for example, or part-time at a nonprofit that may be taking care of their children or other family members. And right now they're not eligible for student loan forgiveness. Let's bring them in into the tent. Let's, let's have that as part of the process. So I'm looking forward to hearing the Department of Education's response and, and the Biden administration's response, and of course, working with you in the future on this. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that. Um, you know, um, have you made that letter from the commissioner to the Biden administration public? Yes, it is public. It's on our website. I'm happy to share it with you, council member, and with um, the committee staff here and your yeah. colleagues. Um, that could so have that been, have that would have been terrific, just as your testimony. Yes. Um, or you could have built off that. But thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the complexity and how, in many respects, it is the burden of those who are um, giving a loan to the loans to uh, educate people about how to uh, pay off, but also achieve loan forgiveness. Um, are there, do you have suggestions and recommendations for how to improve uh, the introduction as written now? Yeah, um, I think, well, I think it's, it's a great bill and that's why we, we support the intent of it. I think there are, um, some things on the margins that that we that uh, my colleagues and and experts in in this work uh, may have. I think first and foremost, I, our Office of Financial Empowerment. This is really their bailiwick. Um, it's not necessarily the Office of Labor Policy and Standards. I know I that's, see. that's the office that's named. That's really a technical change, um, but it's certainly the right agency. Um, there's also, um, I think, something that we want to work with you. Uh, council member and and uh, with the committee is on identifying the universe of folks that uh, that uh, are eligible for this program. Obviously, city employees. We know who who uh, we are. Uh, DCAS um, regularly, you know, communicates with them in a variety of of ways and methods. Um, there's a broader universe, as you know, um, nonprofits in New York City. We don't necessarily have a comprehensive list of every nonprofit in the city. Um, there may be folks that do, I think we want to just engage with you on, on ascertaining how we can, uh, best communicate it, that to, to the broader public that, that may be eligible. Um, one idea that, that we've been, um, going back and forth on is that we certainly have a, a discrete list, uh, potentially of folks that, that do work with the city. There's, uh, you know, plenty of nonprofits that contract with the city. We know the 750. Right, exactly. Perfect. Um, and we certainly have, uh, obviously, their, their information um, by way of our uh, colleagues in the Mayor's Office of Contracting Services and, and uh, I'm sure other partners um, to contact them. But we want to make sure, I think we have the same goals here. We want to make sure that everyone has this information. We want to put it on our landing page, um, again, nyc.gov backslash student loans. And um, like I said, just make sure everyone has the accurate information so that they can make this decision and, and hopefully get enrolled in the program if that's what they want. 
Okay, just want to make sure I heard you and then I'll wrap up. So you're saying switch the name of the office within the agency uh, to which one? Could you just say, uh, say that again? I couldn't hear you. Yeah, it's the Office of Financial Empowerment or OFE. Okay, and uh, the second thing is to for the agency to collect from a variety of sources the broader list of nonprofits that could uh, that could that should that uh, would be sending out the information. Um, and who would send the information to the nonprofit? Is that also DCAS, or would that be your agency? I think as it's currently written, it would that response the DCAS is responsible for communicating to city employees, um, which I think is absolutely appropriate. Um, I think as it's written, um, DCWP would be responsible for broader outreach um, as it relates to other eligible um, folks. And I think, you know, as I mentioned, we want to work with you and, and your colleagues on um, how we can identify that broader universe, because that's not something that inherently we have. Um, so I think that'll be something that, that we can discuss um, in the coming days and, and weeks. Um, and hopefully. so hopefully days, yes. and, but DCWP would do the task of disseminating the information <clears throat> via email, via your website, via yeah. snail mail. Yeah, and we, um, we already do then, a tremendous amount of work and outreach on, on a lot of the student loan debt already, so, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. and um, would, would there then be some form of enforcement to make sure the nonprofit is disseminating the information to their employees? That's not contemplated in the bill. I think we can, we can certainly talk about um, kind of uh, the contours of that, if that's something you're interested in, in working through. Um, I know that, you know, for us, uh, again, I know council member, we've had, we've had conversations offline um, on a number of uh, your other bills and, and kind of uh, enforcement mandates that, that we have, I think um, certainly, uh, you know, just top of line, I think, when you're contemplating an administrative enforcement mechanism, that would certainly yeah. be resources and no, 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 and, no, 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 no resources. Don't no, no resources. Okay. Um, but I do think that um, it would be possible to, for example, include this information in the contract materials that the city um, has with the nonprofits we contract with. So it could be part of the mayor's office of contracts set of paperwork that goes to the nonprofits, for yeah. example. Absolutely. And I think we're, we're, we're happy to look at that and okay. to, to work with you on that. I think something that I was, uh, that I didn't mention at the top is, um, you know, as we kind of started looking at this work in a serious manner over the last few years, we've already um, kind of worked with a lot of our sister agencies, including DCAS, for example, to put a notification um, on job vacancies in, the, in New York City um, about eligibility for the Public Student Loan Forgiveness Program. That's on, you know, job postings now. That wasn't the case until we started looking into this work. So that was like a, I think for us, and it, which what's largely true um, around a lot of the work that falls under our jurisdiction is that affirmative outreach is really the, the best way to get ahead of this. We don't want folks to be delinquent or in default of their loans. We want folks to be empowered with that information at the jump. So um, one, of the, one of the best interventions and something that we thought we could do right away is work with DCAS so that when you, when you apply for a job in the city, you know uh, that uh, in doing so, and if you're, if you're hired, that you're going to be eligible for this program to get yep. potentially your loans forgiven. So I did is want to that, make a note of that. Yeah, and that's fantastic. And I remember Commissioner um, Lorelai Salas being adamant about this and very determined to address this issue. So thank you for mentioning this. Um, do you think we should add that to the law because that was something that that commissioner wanted to do or should we codify that? Uh, as a requirement? Yeah, I think um, I don't want to be committal here. I think the you know, whenever okay. we're talking about amendments to, yeah. to the bill, I know that the law department will need to review that. Yeah. Um, admittedly, I'm I mean, not a lawyer, so I don't yeah. want to get, a, get ahead of yeah. myself there. But 
certainly those are things like in terms of policy, I can tell you discreetly that, of course, our agency supports that. Fair. And then would this also apply to CUNY uh, people who work at CUNY? I'd have to check. Um, it's it's possible. I mean, that's a I, I would have to check. I don't want to I don't want to say something that's that's inaccurate, but I'll follow up with you there. Yeah. Um, great. That's all I can think of. Anything else you want to add? I would just want to reiterate our, our thanks for you introducing uh, this bill for your, um, you know, I know council member, like I said, we, we've had conversations, uh, you know, on, on other uh, introductions you've had. It's always very thoughtful and we, we appreciate, um, you know, your work here in this space. And of course, uh, like I said, that story um, about your staffer is something that like we've heard anecdotally, we've heard that at public hearings. Um, and I know uh, that, you know, the Department of Education, the U.S. Department of De Education has heard those stories as well. So thank you again for raising that. Yeah, great. Actually, one other quick idea, the city has in its job postings that um, loan forgiveness uh, applications are available. Should we require the nonprofits to do that as well? I think wherever uh, there's an opportunity to get awareness about this program, it should be done. Um, but again, I wanna take that back um, and make sure that I don't know what, what the legal contours are and what we can and cannot require or compel folks to. Um, so I wanna yeah. make sure that our, our legal folks uh, take a look at that. Sure, sure. Lastly, uh, and this is a little off topic, but could you talk about your awareness of scams mm -hmm. um, where, uh, you know, there are sort of these scam lo loan pro forgiveness programs um, out there? And should we add anything? Could we talk about adding anything, depending on what your legal team says, to this bill that speaks to that uh, yeah. issue? Yeah. Um, so there are no discrete scams that come to mind um, in terms of the course of our work. I know that they're out there and they exist, of course, but none in terms of our, uh, you know, complaints that we've received, I guess, at DCWP. Um, however, our general counsel division, um, through their investigations and, and work in this space, have certainly identified, um, you know, uh, programs and, and institutions that may not be fully uh, forthright about what, uh, how they're conducting business um, as a higher education institution, for example. Um, as you know, our founding law um, is the consumer protection law. Um, it founded our agency in 1969. It was recently modernized. Thank you. Uh, thanks in part to, to members of this committee for their support. Um, and that law you know, is a broad law that really speaks to deceptive practices in, in, uh, in the public, you know, marketplace. Um, so there are anecdotal, um, um, and in some places, some cases and, uh, systemic issues of, uh, uh, companies or institutions, uh, you know, wrongfully bringing, uh, prospective students in, and saying, hey, you qualified for a scholarship. They, uh, and I'm being hypothetical here um, for yes. the purposes of this hearing, but saying, hey, you qualified for this scholarship, just fill out this information. Um, unbeknownst to that student, they're filling out a loan application. Yeah. Next yeah, thing you know, right. they, they have a loan. So in, in cases like that, okay. where we have enough evidence to, to pursue um, um, further facts, um, that's, that's kind of the space where our, our legal team does. And really the, the cudgel for that work is our consumer protection law. Yeah, I guess I would ask that uh, in terms of your list of things you're bringing back to your legal team, could you add to that? Um, should we, you know, given the fact that, you know, we're, we're having DCAS or anyone with this information, you know, sending the information out, is it worth adding a sentence or two about um, scams, about um, what to keep an eye out for. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we, okay. yes. Although in some ways it's too late, right? Because what this um, 
bill would require is this would apply to people who already have the loan, um, not necessarily for people who are applying to schools. Um, but so, so it's just something to think yeah. about if it makes sense to include this. For sure. And I think okay. the more, the more information that we can get out there, certainly by way of tips and things like that, um, as folks are getting involved in this process, I know financial literacy and uh, we have an incredible team of folks at our office of financial empowerment that are steeped in this work. Um, financial literacy remains a, a, a massive, a massive issue in this country. Um, our financial empowerment centers that, that we run citywide offer free financial counseling. We can't do enough to get that program more promotion. Um, that's really the first step um, to kind of uh, affirmative work uh, to, to get folks to feel confident about their money and, and um, what yeah. different products yeah. mean. And Absolutely. How to yeah. Thank you for that. And are you in the family justice centers, all of them? There are five. Um, in terms of our financial empowerment centers, yeah, yeah. So I'll, there's a there's a whole list of them that and and where they are, and I'll get you that list. I don't have them offhand. There's about um, actually what I meant to say is you have an opportunity to do this in the family justice centers. Mm -hmm. um, they don't do enough with uh, financial empowerment, and they um, always depend on nonprofits yeah. to come in and provide that service for free. So I'm just sort of trying to make a public connection there Yeah, absolutely. Um, for you to be mindful of remembering to go into the family justice center system. And it's there quite possible we do some work with them. I think I just- You do, yeah, yeah. in so one of the boroughs. Yes, there are five. Um, but there's okay. room for expansion as you yeah. noted, <laughs> yep. Yeah, no resources, but yes. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Chair, for the extra time. I appreciate it. Thank you, council member. Uh, I will now call on other council members to ask their questions in the order that they've used the Zoom raise hand function. If you'd like to ask a question and you have not yet raised your hand, please raise it now. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. Sergeant Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. You should begin once I've called on you and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin. I see that council member Chin has a question. Council member? Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to Councilmember Rosenthal for the bill. Um, I'm happy to be a co-sponsor uh, because I just want to follow up with uh, DCWP, um, the representative. Uh, you know, the biggest thing that I remember just for the longest time, you know, this predatory uh, institution that targets immigrant community um, with, you know, oh, you can get a college you know, education, you can be able to get a better job. And then all of a sudden people signed up and they didn't know that they signed up for a loan. And this goes way back, even way before I was in the city council when I was working uh, at CUNY. Uh, so I think with the, the loan forgiveness program, my question to you is that, how do we you know, get these like information out to community that are most, most vulnerable, like all the you know targeting immigrant community, and I know that the um, uh, the mayor you know with his executive order has set aside you know a certain percentage of in terms of outreach and media uh, to immigrant community. So I wanted to see like is DCWP sort of utilizing that resource um, to do outreach to these community. I mean a lot of them. And I said many times in hearing, they got ethnic newspaper, radio station, TV station. Uh, we utilize those channels to let people know that there are these programs that are available um, that they can access. Because some of them are saddled with huge loans and they might not even know that, hey, there's an opportunity if they're working for a nonprofit or they're, if they're working for a city agency or a, a council member's office that they could uh, take advantage of, of this and hopefully get some help. Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you, council members. Good to see you again. Um, for us, there's, you know, outreach has to be multifaceted. It's particularly difficult when you're talking about student loan debt and particularly difficult in general when you talk about financial 
uh, anything related to the finances of individuals, because it's a private matter in a lot of cases and, and culturally, and um, it, it varies in terms of how open folks want to be um, and how uh, about their finances and, and how much they want to talk about it. It is a, an intimate issue and one that um, it's an inherent challenge, uh, but something we're up to the task um, to, to help uh, bridge the gap on. I think. Yeah, I mean, when we're talking about, I mean, I, uh, the focus on the ethnic media, I think because I oftentimes is free publicity. You can do an op-ed piece. Uh, you can do a, a piece about a successful story that you were able to help somebody, you know, get this uh, loan forgiveness program. And oftentimes it's the parent or a relative that reads the article and they can bring the, the news back to their kids. Uh, so I think that that's really an important um, tools that we can use. I mean, I mean, that's why, you know, committing also city resource, you know, once in a while you should buy an ad and, and pay for some pay advertisement to support these local, you know, media, but they are definitely welcome um, articles and, and information from city agency, especially about a program that can help members of their community. So yeah. I really want to urge you to, to kind of like help us, you know, publicize this program is to talk about some of the program that, that your agency offer and really right. tout, you know, and really kind of brag about it, that you have this resource and, and people can uh, apply and how, and how they can help, you know, with their student loans. Yeah, absolutely. We, we are looking forward to doing more in this space. Um, we did run uh, student loan debt ads um, a little bit ago um, all over the city. We leveraged ethnic media um, and you might've seen the ads out in, in, the, in the public. Mm -hmm. uh, they were on, uh, you know, bus shelters and, and uh, subway ads as well as uh, other public furniture. Um, with kind of quick phrases that we hoped would get people's attention in the sense that saying, saying things that like student loan debt doesn't necessarily equate student loan distress. Um, other kinds of uh, kind of one sentence lines to really get folks to go to our landing page and get a little bit of information that way. But there's obviously a lot more um, that needs to be done in the space. And um, I'm, in, I'm expired. Uh, encouraged to, to work with you and, and of course, the sponsor and other members of this committee um, on ideas going forward. Yeah, I guess the final is like whether we need to be that specific in the bill in terms of doing outreach to, you know, local and ethnic media. Um, yeah. It's our, it's already message. part of what we mm -hmm. do. So, mm -hmm. you know, we welcome, we welcome uh, that. And uh, yeah, we're, we're often, we're often leveraging our, our partners and, and of course, abiding by our local law for language access provisions as well. It's something that's critical, especially in our work. Um, I mean, when you talk about worker protection, you're talking about consumer rights, you have to meet people at the language that they're most comfortable speaking. Mm -hmm. That's fundamental to our work and something that our commissioner and our, our senior leadership team here really cherishes. Yeah, and we appreciate that and, and, and really thank you for um, all the great work that your agency has been doing. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member. I see Council Member Rosenthal has a follow-up question. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Council Member Chin, thank you for bringing that up and um, putting that on the record. I will definitely be adding that to my list of things that perhaps we should include in the legislation. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, just a quick technical question about the private school loans. Are those loans eligible for loan forgiveness? No, they wouldn't be. Um, as far as I understand it, um, the loan forgiveness program really speaks to public loans. Um, and that's something, you know, you bring up, um, you know, tangentially, you've, you've brought up a, a great point in terms of another kind of layer of confusion that folks have when they get a student lo loan. Um, it doesn't necessarily say in, in, you know, big, bold letters, this is private, this is public, you know, folks don't necessarily have that in inherent um, information. 
uh, nor should they have to try and figure that out, right? We need to be out there and, and explaining what what makes a loan private, what what doesn't, and and uh, where you should be seeking at least first first assistance from. Um, so uh, to to speak to your to answer your question, no, um, private loans are not implicated in the forgiveness program, but um, do you from an outreach perspective, know? yeah, yeah, you gotta you gotta do that before people yes. sign up for those schools um, to know yes. that those loans will never be forgivable. Um, uh, our, and now we're going down a different road and I'll definitely end it in my five minutes, but uh, do you know if the private schools are required to put on their websites and any advertising material that their loans are not forgivable? I don't believe there is a mandate for, for schools to give that kind of disclosure. Would um, that be a state or a city law that could change that? That's a, uh, I don't believe, yeah. I don't believe the city would have jurisdiction over that. But again, I don't want to get ahead of uh, a legal analysis yeah. there. Um, yeah. But I'll say this, yeah. it should, you know, I'm, I think, again, let me ask you, policy, can I, yeah, can I just jump in? I'm so sorry. I have two minutes left. Um, real quickly, would it be possible for the city's website to have a page about all the private schools or a bunch of private schools, whether or not uh, taking a loan out for them from them is forgivable with the public programs, number one. Number two, identifying what percentage of the, the students there graduate and get a job in that field uh, over a certain period of time and how long do they last in it? Whether or not the students reap the rewards that are promised on the private school's advertising material could, because I know that information is collected but you have to really search for it. Uh, it's online, you can do a search in Google. But could the cities, your department post that information on a page? It's possible for us to put that on. I We cannot compel, obviously, like I said, like, you know, there would have to be no, a no, law. I get that. But, but could you do it is the point. And then could you add to your information material when you do financial empowerment, a one pager that says, here are the private schools, here's some information about them. One big, big bold letters, mm -hmm. you will never have access to a federal, to a government loan forgiveness program if you sign up, uh, if you take out a loan at one of these private schools. And oh, by the way, here's the, um, here are the outcomes for these students. Yeah, I mean, yes, uh, in short, we can definitely collect, amplify certain information about schools and what, what uh, you know, what folks may be eligible or not eligible for that that's like as a, as a uh, is it doable? I think probably yes. Um, but then, you know, there's obviously, and what I would want to engage with you and, and have other folks in the room for, for that conversation is like, what is practical? I know information overload is a big thing in this space. Um, right. I so guess I wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll turn it back to the chair, but um, I'd like to, for the record, try to add that piece to this bill, uh, if at all possible. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Seeing no further hands raised for questions, we will move to public testimony. Council members who have questions for our panelists should use the raise hand function in Zoom and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. I would like to now welcome Blair Hendricks to testify. Uh, Blair? Time starts now. Good morning. My name is Blair Hendricks, and I'm a third year law student at St. John's University, and I'm here to speak about intro 2130 from the point of view of a borrower and someone who might be eligible for the program in the future. 
For many law students, student loan debt is a huge burden, especially for public law interest students like me. My interest is consumer advocacy, and I dream of having a career where I help my community fight against unfair business practices to keep their house and against housing discrimination. Law students are forced to go through law or lawyers are forced to go through law school to become lawyers. It's unlike other grad programs where you can forego uh, other degrees to pursue a career. You have to acquire more debt in most cases to be a lawyer. Particularly for us in New York City, while there are many, many other law students across the country like me who have passion for public interest law, for those of us in New York City, the high cost of living further compounds our student debt burden. Many of us live in tiny apartments with multiple roommates just to make ends meet. And unfortunately, many very passionate, very skilled and capable law students will turn to careers in big law firms or corporate law just to ensure that they will be able to make a living to continue living in the city and pay off their debt. As a result, our community loses out as a whole. Many people who desperately depend on legal service organizations and nonprofits to, re, uh, to meet their uh, demand and their need for legal services. And so in some cases, such as in criminal defense work, they're constitutionally guaranteed uh, right to, to defense um, goes unfilled. At best, it will be filled by those who can afford to take the positions uh, regardless of their passion or skill for the work. And at worst, they may go unfilled at all. This bill is really important because it would allow public law students um, and future public lawyers to know that there is a way out from the debt burden. And just to, to touch back on a, a point that Councilmember Rosenthal made about scams, I've gotten many calls about uh, student loan forgiveness scams. And to have um, a city agency or a nonprofit come to me about forgiveness program seems to me much safer and I like a source that I would trust more and I'm sure many others would be in the same boat. As such, I want to endorse the passage of uh, intro uh, 2130 as uh, a hope for public interest lawyers like me who might depend on this program in order to, to provide the services that our community needs. Thank you, Blair. Uh, I see that uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, Chair, you don't have any questions for our panel. See? Okay, we'll turn to Councilmember Rosenthal to ask some questions. Councilmember? Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Hendricks, thanks so much for coming and testifying today. This is incredibly valuable information. Um, can I ask a couple of specific questions? I don't, and if it's too personal, just don't. I'd prefer not to respond. This is pretty informal. No, that's okay. Don't Please worry go about ahead. It. Um, so, so tell me about the places that have reached out to you as a law student. In other words, is it a private company that reaches out to you and says, hey, we can take over your loan and you can pay it back at a lower interest rate? So I don't understand what you just said. Sorry. Sure. So there's... I know that the calls that I have gotten, I'm almost certain are scam calls. They're not from legitimate companies at all. Um, they sound very real. The first time that I got one, I nearly called back. Um, they sound like real people on the phone, not like the robo calls that you usually get. Um, and it struck me because while I sometimes get calls about car warranties um, that I don't have, this one I did have. <laughs> and most, many, right. many young people do have student loan debt. So it's usually something like, hey, just wanted to let you know that you qualify for the student loan forgiveness program. It's brand new. Like, please give us a call back at whatever number. But they don't mention a specific company. Another thing that I've been warned about regarding student loan forgiveness or refinancing is um, refinancing plans or forgiveness plans that come from banks or other companies. And I've been warned that sometimes these refinancing programs don't work for you the way that they sell them to you. Um, I haven't, I don't have specific information off the top of my head. Unfortunately, this information comes from a student loan uh, panel that my group, the, the consumer advocacy group on campus put on a few years ago, where they warned us mm -hmm. that some uh, banks or some other companies will help consolidate loans or help refinance, but then they will take money off the top. And that sure. even though you think you are paying your full loan, you're actually not paying the full amount that you owe and will still be in more debt and possibly in default later on. And it's very scary to think about that happening and to have a 
an agency or an employer or someone from the government put out a notice to say, this is how you get student loan forgiveness, or this is where you can check if you are eligible, seems a lot safer than these constant bombardments of scammers or potentially banks that are, you know, legitimate companies, but are not working for me the way that I think they are, they hope they are. Um, And I think that's really important for a lot of borrowers. And, you know, I really understand um, uh, DCWP's point about information overload. I do respect that, but perhaps even on the information documents we're talking about, we have to hit on those points that here are the types of scams that you might be offered. Um, Don't, they are scams. Um, And then St. John's is a private university, I think? Yes, but I do have um, public debt from my undergrad. As mentioned before, many of us come from other public institutions um, with debt already. Um, and there are students who go to non-private law, law schools. So it's, it's a good law for, for all of us. That's right. But would it be possible, and again, I'm speaking from pure ignorance, um, to get a, I went to a private graduate school, but got a federal loan. It, was that mm-hmm. accessible to you? I, I think it. I think it was because I have as my my public debt, it's a federal loan, but I went to a private undergrad. So I, again, I'm not entirely sure of how the process works down to the last yeah. detail, but um, uh, I do believe that is possible. And I think there are people who can qualify for public loans for private institutions, but I know there are people who also have private loans on top of public loans and it just gets very complicated. So it it would be helpful to your point to have um, a listing of you know where you can find information about private loans or about public public loans for private schools. It's it's very complicated to, to navigate as a borrower, especially when you're 18 just starting out. Wow, you I think you just told the whole story right there. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for taking the time to come and testify. It's incredibly important to get this information on the record and we'll try to tweak the bill um, accordingly. Similarly, Thank you for having you me. Spe- yeah, if you have specific suggestions, feel free to submit that as an addendum to your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. If any other council members have a question for our panelists, please raise your hand on Zoom now. Thank you. If we have inadvertently missed anyone else who has registered to testify today and has yet to be called, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called on in the order that your hand was raised. Seeing no hands raised, I will turn it over to Chair Ayala to offer closing remarks. Chair? Yeah, I just wanna say thank you uh, to to all of you who showed up uh, today to provide testimony. And I I specifically wanna thank, you know, Council Member Rosenthal. Um, I think that we've all learned uh, a lot about, you know, the experiences of um, uh, student loan borrowers and, and the difficulties that, you know, that they face. Uh, So thank you so much for really shining a light on this issue. Um, thank you, Blair, for uh, for your testimony. Um, and with that, uh, I have nothing further.